so good morning uh, to all of you and my regards and my best wishes to all of you i am extremely grateful to dr tiwari for giving me this honor i always love to be visiting colleges i started my career as a lecturer in sociology at hindu college those days were very different those days it was felt that if you are in college you will retire as a lecturer and there was no possibility of your promotion your possibility of becoming a reader and of course professor was completely ruled out so these jobs were supposed to be you know you are stuck to that and moreover the other feeling about the colleges was that the colleges are teaching institutions they are not research institutions so it's a routine teaching and the third thing about the college lecturers was that they come for 2 hours for 3 hours sometimes they don't come because there was no biometric system which of course is not there till today and no attendance so sometimes they come they may not come this was the reputation i joined hindu college and i served hindu college for 9 years before i moved to the university first as a lecturer and later on i became a reader and of course then i climbed the hierarchy and i became the professor now i cherish those days in the college in fact to to put it uh, um, honestly and also it will be an inspiration to you whatever i am today is because of my training at hindu college teaching the undergraduate students it was a big challenge i was hardly 22 22 years old or so i had just finished my masters in sociology from delhi school of economics and i was appointed a lecturer 3 months later and it was such a big challenge because the students were almost of my age and uh, they wouldn't um, uh, uh, sit in the class properly and also uh, they would not be you know uh, interested in the subject and teaching was a great uh, great challenge but i withstood the challenge and in fact in fact when i was leaving in the college for the university to tell you frankly i did not want to leave i wanted to continue and my eyes were always on hindu college and so it came to me as a as a big blessing and a big boon when i was appointed the principal of hindu college so i went back to the same college as the principal and 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 then i try to i try to you know tell my teachers my colleagues that never look down upon the college teaching the university teachers believe me i was in the university for many years before i went on um, you know premature retirement and moved to calcutta i live in calcutta and i'm managing right now two institutions one as the director of anthropological survey and the other as the director general of raja ram mohan roy library foundation government of india institution and i used to tell my 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 colleagues in hindu college that that if you really want to become a good teacher you have to start your career from a college look at the way in which you teach a student who come straight from the school who are as childish as they were in the school and so it's a big uh, big big challenge so i'm really happy to be here and talking to you about about the thing now of course as you know and i'm sure other people will come and speak to you on the thing now you know when we were students we never heard the term globalization this term was non existent and the second thing is that even now when we use the term globalization 
many people say that uh, we don't know what it is, but we know what it is not. We don't know what it is. There is a plethora of definitions of globalization. And please remember, in correct English, plethora is not a good word. Plethora actually means access. And this is used in a negative sense, like plethora of problems. So there are plethora of definitions of globalization. If you start collecting, you'll find they're almost endless. And more and more are being, being added. Because globalization, as someone said, globalization is like a domestic animal who is being domesticated by different disciplines. So economists say we have uh, contributed to globalization, political scientists say, sociologists say, the people from literature say, people from architecture say, and now psychologists also say that there's something called globalization. And so one of the questions which is asked here is, is what is that we understand by this? What is that we are referring to? Now the topic you have chosen, in fact, I really liked it and that was one of the reasons why I immediately consented to come here and to speak to you. You know, the, the things which you have said in your topic, I don't know whether it happened consciously or unconsciously, psychologists talk about it. But what you are saying here is, number one, globalization does not lead to an effacement or a destruction or a demolition of diversities. That's the first thing you are saying. You are saying in the seminar that globalization does not lead to what is called homogenization. Globalization would not lead to a world where everyone is the same or everyone has the same culture. On the contrary, what you are saying is that globalization would reinforce diversity. And I will later on as I proceed, I shall tell you that there's a very famous statement which comes in my discipline of sociology and anthropology is that culture is resilient, which actually means cultures don't die. Cultures continue. Cultures are able to, able to survive. So look at the television uh, channels. You'll find a large number of programs which are catering to your cultural themes. Okay? Sometimes uh, I happen to see some of these soap operas which come in the evening after 8.30 or so, because my wife is very fond of uh, it. And since I have to stay in the same room in which my wife stays, so I have to see those programs as well. Now, all these programs which are about uh, women, about men, and these women are all very well decked up. Every time they are decked up, there's one program she sees, I don't remember the na name, where the marriage is going on. For weeks together, the marriage is going on, and these women are always in uh, dresses, you know, and they are scheming. One woman is scheming against the other, so many things. And I always say that what is happening here are the underlying Indian values, which come to the fore. One of the books which I read, I enjoyed it intensely, was by Sudhir Kakkar, which was on the inner psyche, inner world as it was, it was called. And he was one of the very famous qualitative researchers in psychoanalysis. His writings have always inspired me and it covered a very large arena. His work on the healing traditions in India is a remarkable text and it is read in, uh, in, in anthropology. I regard him very, very high. And <coughs> in this book, on inner word, he talks about the underlying values, the thing which are not seen but are there, the kind of expectations we have, the role relationship we have, what is expected of that kind of a 
of, of a thing. How people are judged. What kinds of values are transmitted through the traditional family system? What do you want your children to be? And these are all being done in a latent manner. Latent means hidden, hidden manner, things which are, which are going on. In fact, I personally think that psychology is a great discipline. Great discipline because it talks about those areas which we do not take into, into consideration. And therefore, therefore, the first thing which comes up here is, it's a question you are, you are raising. Globalization does not lead to a marginalization of diversity and so culture is resilient. If culture is resilient, so is the thinking of the people and therefore there can't be one universal psychology, there has to be several kinds of psychology. And I'm sure you must be knowing the school of cultural psychology has to say exactly the same thing, that how culture and the mental phenomena, how they interact and different kinds of combination, different kinds of thing, things result. The second thing you are saying in your title is you are raising a question. Does globalization lead to equality? Equality at the apparent level at the apparent level seems to be seems to be equality but does it happen underneath also there was a man called Khalid uh, Mustafa his statement is very good he says apparently people seem to be equal underlying this are the inequalities which are inherent, which are transmitted. So there's a concept called, you like this concept, equality of opportunities. So equal opportunities are given to you. So when the teacher is teaching, the teacher is expected to look at each student. The teacher is expected to explain to everyone, complete equality is is maintained. You are supposed to subscribe to the rules and do not worry about other things. Some student may be good, some may be bad. So equal opportunities are given. Now in many of the Delhi colleges now, these teachers distribute notes and many of the photocopy shops, I don't know whether it happens in your college or not, many of the photocopy shops in the colleges, they have these notes. This color select the, the papers have been put together and they are sold. So the teacher would say, all the articles which you have to read, they are available there. Go and buy it. Although I have seen some of them, they are very bad. I mean, you just can't read because photocopy wallas use less ink and also the smudgy, you know, uh, prints. Anyway, so notes are for all. Teaching is for all. Examination has the same rules. But the paradox is equality of opportunities coexists with inequality emerging. So equality of opportunity leads to inequality. This is a paradox because when the examination would happen, some of you will get very good marks, some of you will not get good marks, some will fail, some will pass, some will have compartment, you know, all kinds of things are there. Now, will you stand up and say, you have been unjust to me? No, you will not say this. Why you will not say this? Because the system will say, we gave you equal opportunities. And so if you become unequal, this is not my, my fault. This is not, uh, this is not uh, our fault. Eventually what happens is, it comes down to the, the endowment of the individual. This is an important point. Endowment of the individual, what you are, the kind of opportunities you have, the kind of constraints which come from the, from the system. It's a common thing, you must have, must have, must have noticed it that suppose my sister gets a commonwealth fellowship to go to England to study. What will my parents do? 
I'm talking about, uh, about uh, families, say, 10 years ago or even uh, 15 years ago. Even now, my parents would say, get married and then go. Why? Why? If I get a Commonwealth Fellowship, I also got a Commonwealth Fellowship. I lived in England all alone. Okay? My parents never said this. But why it is, it is so? Which means that the ramparts of inequality are always there. It's a very nice word. Ramparts of inequality are always there. That was the reason why Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in his very famous book called Discovery of India, he said, he said, the spirit of the age, I am quoting Panditji, spirit of the age is in favor of equality. Now listen to the sentence. Spirit of the age is in favor of equality. However, the practice denies it everywhere. The practice the actual practice denies it everywhere. And thus, you are exploring in this the relationship between globalization and equality. Does equality result? And what is to be done for creating equality? Because the main aim of social sciences, and I believe psychology is a social science, the main, main aim of social sciences is to reduce inequality among human beings. And today, if you look at the post-development discourse, which is very popular now, we say that do not ignore the biodiversity, the animals around you, the birds around you, the mountains and the lakes around you, the glaciers around you, because if tomorrow they all disappear, you will also collapse. So the world should not be seen as just consisted of human beings. This is a wrong idea. The world consists of several systems. The animal system, the plant system, flora and fauna, the mountains, the lakes, everything. Therefore, this may be a new concept for, for you, but today in sociology, we don't use the word universe. Uni means one. Words, universe means one word. We don't use the word universe. We say the word has to be seen as consisted of several words. And so we use the term, you will like this word. The word is not one, there are several words, and so think in terms of what is called pluriverse, P-L-U-R-I-V-E-R-S-E. -E. Pluriverse means many, many words together. So <coughs> you exist in relationship with the animals, with the plant, with the lakes and mountain, and there must be a relationship of equality with them. That is why you should not be surprised if the honorable courts say that river is a living entity. River is a living entity, animate. It has its own life and you can't actually take away its life. You know, in many of the judgment, it has, it has come. And <coughs> it also says, it also says that the feeling of fraternity, the feeling of familial relationship, should be with all these things. So don't harm animals. Don't harm birds. Have affection for, for them. Because without them, you will not be able to, able to survive. And in my own life, I have seen how biodiversity has completely changed. Do you see sparrows in Delhi? No, now you don't see. You don't see. I remember I live very close by in Chitranjan Park. Hundreds of sparrows should, used to come in the morning. And I used to give them grains to, to eat. I'm very fond of, fond of birds. Now you don't see them. You only see two birds around you, the pigeons and the crows. You don't see any other birds. But where have these sparrows gone? The sparrows are a very shy bird. They have gone somewhere else. Now, these kinds of changes which are occurring, how many types of fruits are available? And 
as a social scientist, you have to take cognizance of, of these things. One of the lessons which comes in social sciences is, and you have not to forget this, is, is no relationship is bereft of power. No relationship is, is vacuous of power. Power is there in every relationship, whether it is the political power or economic power or social power or moral power, moral power. Like, you know, I don't have any, any uh, I'm not your teacher. Huh? Even if you run out of this room, what will I do? I will not say anything. Hmm? If you start throwing uh, tomatoes and others on me, I will not say anything because I don't have any of these power like social power, political power, you know, uh, economic power, but there's something else I have over you. And this is called moral power. Right? So you will not leave. You will not leave the class because, and that moral power is emerging out of my scholarship, is emerging out of the position I am I am holding, is emerging out of the fact that I belong to a different age group. Hmm? I have uh, grandchildren. I mean, as uh, not as old as you are, but they are of course, uh, of course, there. And uh, so I belong to that. So it's moral power which is emerging. No relationship is free from power. That is why we say that we have to follow what is called non-zero-sum concept, which actually means, you know, zero-sum is that the total of the power exercised by two people is zero. For example, in friendship, in friendship, two friends, and you think that they are, they are equal, I exercise no power over you, you exercise no power over me, therefore the sum total of the power is zero. But does it happen? No, it doesn't happen. Even in the most close relationship, relationship in the peer group, one takes decision and the other complies. Okay, my friend says, oh, let's go and eat uh, chola bhatura. Okay, now my stomach is running. I'm not very happy. Huh? I say, no, no, I, my stomach will not agree with this. But my friend says, come on, forget about it, come. And I go with them. Although, all through I'm thinking of the toilet, you know, when I'm eating. So what I'm saying is, is that you, there's a word used for this, you succumb to it. So no relationship is free from power. The same thing applies to, the same thing applies to the objects and the things around you. Now, I will be linking all this up with the, with globalization. All these things, you know, they all, 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 all linked up. The things, I mean, when you go to the market, just tell me, why do you want to buy a Colgate? Hmm? Or a particular product, my, my grandson, to give you an autobiographical example, my grandson, who is reading in a college in, 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 in Delhi. Now, this morning he told me that, um, very interesting thing, he told me, and I thought I will make use of this. He told me that, uh, that uh, many of these um, shampoos, hmm, <coughs> they, they have sulfate. And he said that I don't want to use it. And I said, well, you don't use uh, Clinic Plus, use Dove. Huh? He said, no, no, no. I want to try the products of Patanjali. Let me, face wash should also be, also be from the same shop. Now, I immediately thought, how has he arrived at the decision? Is it his decision or there is an underlying constraint on him he doesn't realize it something which comes with the product in psychology you have something called subliminal effect you go to see a film hmm? and just before the interval is going to happen a bottle of coca-cola will come or uh, thumbs up or whatever will come and the bottle will come like this 
Kempa Cola, Kempa Cola, Kempa Cola, Coca Cola, as if it's just going to fall on you. It will come so close, it will go away. Come so close. And then what you will do is you'll come out, go to the canteen and say, one Coca Cola. Eh? One Coca Cola. Even when you don't need. The, these are called the subliminal effects. The products around you, they exercise power. You don't realize it. That is why we say, that is why we say, the things which have come with globalization, they are powerful. They are putting power on you. And you, let us use the same word, you succumb to it. For, I'm just looking to my own life, for, believe me, no jokes, for 19 years, I never used any toothpaste. I never had any dental problem. What did I do? I used to take, as my grandmother taught, taught me, as my mother taught me, I used to take salt, okay, put some uh, mustard oil, press it, okay, and then apply over my, my teeth, okay, and keep on applying till it becomes, becomes white enough. And then I will go and drink a little water rather than gargling or rather than throwing the water out. Because my mother used to say, whatever you have eaten is, uh, is food. So let it go inside you. Very good. For years together, years together. Hmm? Now, today when I have to make a choice, when I go to the market, will I do the same thing? No, I will not do the same thing. I will not do. What will I do? What will I do? I look for the products which are exercising power on me. That is why, you know, sometimes when we use the word globalization, we use the word hegemony. Hegemony of globalization. Now, you see, I told you in the beginning when I began that, uh, that there is no one definition. Hmm? But some of these ideas are common when you deal with globalization and uh, I will finally come to the the psychological aspects in, in this hmm? um, we have not kept psychology here but I think there should come the idea of what is called global psychology I'll just come to uh, uh, come to that and I'll try to wind up within the time which has been given to me hmm? just remind me when it is uh, it is it is the time is over um, so uh, so couple of things are clear. Number one, the first is, the first point is, is globalization is an historical epoch. It has its own history. It has, it has its own way of development. I will basically talk about these four things and then I'll come to, come to other, other things about psychology. First is, and then I'll come back to come back to them again. History. The second is, it is a concept where economic phenomena come together. Is a is a is a ensemble. E n s e m b l e is an ensemble. It is uh, it is a collection of economic phenomena. Third is that globalization is essentially American. Americanization of the world. And the fourth is globalization has technological, sociological consequences. Four ideas. And these are the four meanings of globalization, the way they have been explored. Although, when you start looking at the literature, you will find people talking about economic globalization, political globalization, ecological globalization, they talk about cultural globalization, social globalization, so on and so forth. That is unimportant. These are the four basic, basic meaning. There's some kind of a, a history. I don't know whether you heard the name of a man called Andre Gunder Frank. He was actually the founder of what is known as dependency theory. He said that globalization is an ancient phenomenon. You go back to the Sumerian civilization. 
you go back to the trade which went on between the Indus Valley and the, the other. That was also, also globalization, which actually means, which actually means that no society is ever isolated. Societies have been notwithstanding the fact that they may have their sovereignty, notwithstanding the fact that they had their own political kingdom, they had owned their way of administration, societies were always in relationship with the other societies. So there was interaction, there was a migration of, of people, there were relations of war and scrimmage, there were relations of raids, okay, or some kind of a of a balance between the societies because each one is very powerful. These relations have always been there. No society is isolated. At least the changes, very important point, the changes which are occurring in the wider world, they have their impact on society. I give an example as a footnote. You may have heard of a tribal community which is called particularly vulnerable tribal groups. PVTG. 75 communities in India are PVTG. India has 4,635 communities of which 75 communities are called particularly vulnerable tribal group. And one such community is called Sentinelese. You may have heard their name if you remember the news uh, which came in uh, in, uh, in November that one American tried to enter into their island and was alleged to have been killed. So this is the Sentinelese. Now this is the only community in the whole world, the Sentinelese, who live in an island called North Sentinel Island. This is the only community in the world which is uncontacted, totally isolated. And we have absolutely no interaction with them. And they are protected by the legal system. If anyone tries to go there, would be put behind the bars. Now, do you think that because they are, they are isolated, they are having no contact with the outside world? Yes, of course, they are having no con human contact. But what about global warming? What about the... <coughs> What about the global climate changes which are occurring? Hmm? Now, climate change is not something which is occurring only in uh, one part of the world. It is happening all over the, all over the world. So you have the famous statement that uh, trees are being cut down in Nepal and there is flooding in Bangladesh because of this, this, this relationship. So no community has ever been isolated and there have been relationship between the communities. So communities were always interconnected. People have been moving out in search of greener pastures and, and other things. And so globalization is not a recent phenomenon. This is one view. But the other view is, the other view is that that kind of an interrelationship the kind of interrelationship of which Andre Gunder Frank is talking, or other people are talking, that even in the past, that there was global uh, relationship, they don't realize that those relationships were highly restricted. In the sense, X community comes in contact with Y and Z. But here is a phenomenon where, where it is all over, all over. I don't know, but I was told, I read, that the, the, the cartoon program called Simpson, which children see, it is watched <coughs> in at least 200 countries of the world. Simpson, Pogo, you know, these are, these are programs, you know, uh, which come, the children enjoy it. Doraemon, Doraemon is everywhere everywhere. You are in Japan, you are in Malaysia, you are in, in Sudan, you are in uh, America, everywhere. Eh? You get down in any airport, you will see Pizza Hut, you see McDonald's, everywhere, you see, huh? 
everywhere you'll, you'll find it. What kind of a change is this? As someone pointed out, all airports look alike. The system of governance is the same in all airports. You have to remove your belt. I'm talking about men and also women. Uh, you have to remove your belt when you go for your security checkup. Whether it happens to be Siliguri, uh, what is called Bagdogra, or it happens to be to be uh, China or anywhere, you know, you have to follow. You have to comply, comply with this. Some kind of a of a what is called globality that you have to behave in that in that in that manner. Otherwise, otherwise you will be simply thrown outside. You will not be a part of, if you start saying, I can't remove my, my belt because my trousers will fall, they will not accept it. You should have worn the trouser which can sustain even when you are not wearing the belt. You know, there's a kind of, kind of thinking which, which comes. Now this globality, now look at this word, this kind of a thing, this globality, is something which is a characteristic of the post cold war scenario there's a second argument cold war which is supposed to have started in the late 1940s supposed to have come to an end with the dissolution of united uh, ussr hmm, union uh, soviet uh, uh, you know public republic and and this is supposed to be the end of uh, although you know i i should not go into this that there is a debate about when cold war actually came into into uh, to to existence also when it came to an end but there's a there's a period it was in the mid of cold war 70s mid 70s that we started talking about globalization. Obviously, so when I was a student, we never heard of globalization. Eh? Now we are hearing globalization. It was not there. The concept was not there. And today we say globalization is the third candidate in the lineage of development from colonization, modernization, and then globalization. That's the relationship colonization being the first one when when the colonies came up the the lesser developed areas were colonized then came modernization in between there was something called westernization also when we but modernization includes uh, is this as a whole and finally you have this globalization so it is not something which is happening now but from 1970s the intensity of globalization has really increased. And I can link up with your, uh, with your own experiences. Actually, one thing which I, which I want to tell you as a young student, and this is something for which psychology has made a very important contribution. Charity begins at home. What does it mean? If you want to understand the concept, look into your own... Uh, environment around you. You know, Jean Piaget, who gave the theory of learning, how this theory came, you know, he observed his own children. Observed his own children, and by observing his own children, he arrived at this concept of, of uh, learning. Huh? So, don't ignore this. I mean, I can give you another example. Sigmund Freud. What is this whole thing based on? On the, on the illness experiences of his patients. The patients came for different kinds of problems. He was a doctor. But those case studies led him to this. Or take up the concept of primary group, which we all use. And primary group, the concept was given in 1905 by Charles Horton Cooley. And you know what he did? He observed his own children and he called his household, under quote, domestic laboratory. Household is domestic laboratory, laboratory, as it is said, that observe them. Because what is happening in your family is happening in other families also. Right? So you are not, not unique in that respect. So observe your own situation. I remember when I arrived in England for my doctorate, 
many, many years ago. In those times, maybe called prehistoric times when I arrived. Believe me, I had no idea of how to get out of the airport. I had no idea of how to seek immigration, how to, how to handle the whole thing. Absolutely no idea. First time I saw what are called travelators, the cart. It was not in, uh, in, in Delhi airport, first time. And gradually what happens is these things have become so common. And you see all this happening in your, uh, in your lifetime. I returned from uh, England after my PhD and I bought some shirts, Marks and Spencer for my brother, for my brothers-in-law, huh? you know, some of these Marks and Spencer. And I'm sure they must have told their relatives, my brother must have told his wife and her relative, oh, this is a Marks and Spencer shirt. Because what we were wearing were the shirts made by our local uh, tailor, huh? okay? And these are very expensive thing. Now you see, these products are very easily, easily available. Things have dramatically and drastically, they have changed. This is the beginning of globality around you. However, the point you have to remember, however, globalization is not universalization. Do not think that what it does has become the universal thing. Why? Because notwithstanding the things which are coming from outside, we are keeping our own ways, our own patterns alive. Alive. How many people in India have what are called live-in relationship? Not a very high number. How many people are non-monogamous? Very few people. What about the stability of marriages? Yes, marriages are very, very, very stable. So the cultural pattern which are continuing. You know, I live in Calcutta, and one thing which I find is that the Bengali upper classes, upper middle classes, they have just one child. One child. They don't want to have even the even the second um, second child. They don't think the way in which some of us may think that there must be a sibling. They don't think think like this. This is their cultural pattern. Huh? Their involvement, I am amazed. Their involvement in Durga Puja. The whole city of Calcutta is transformed. It's a pleasure to be in uh, Calcutta around the puja time. You can't imagine the gaiety, the celebration, the involvement of the, of the people moving from one pandal to the other pandal. The kind of diversity which comes up doesn't happen in all parts of the country. The sweet shops, Calcutta has sweet shop, wonderful sweet shop. And I have come to know, although I have not studied, that these sweet shops have their research divisions. Can you imagine? So each time at the time of Durga Puja, each year at the time of Durga Puja, they will come out with a new kind of sondesh, new kinds of uh, kinds of, of, of things, and people would uh, would uh, eat it, although they eat very very little. So these are the kind of cultural patterns which are surviving. Therefore, globalization certainly is not universalization, and globalization has to be seen as an historical epoch which does not lead to i link up with the first one to what is called what is called homogenization come to the second aspect a constellation of economic phenomena you have all kinds of things here liberalization of the market deregulation you have all those concepts you know which which come here Important thing is, it is leading to, leading to a different sales culture. Put it in inverted comma, sales culture. The kind of products which are being, being sold. It leads to a different culture of buying and acquiring. Buying and acquiring. You go by what are called the products. The value of the, of the products. The name of the of the product. 
it leads to a different pattern of consumption the different pattern of consumption i mean no one could have ever imagined some years ago that you would go to the market and buy what is called yogurt i mean my own house for years together yogurt what is called curd it was processed at home my mother used to do and i still remember she would put a little bit of curd and uh, and and fill the vessel with the with the um, with uh, uh, lukewarm uh, 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 you know milk and then interesting she used to do like this i often wondered why she was doing it because this is what uh, her mother used to do this is what her grandmother used to do i don't know the relationship but these are called fetishes you combine it uh, combine it uh, it with, with that you know then when um, uh, surinder amarnath or mahendra amarnath used to come and play they would have a red hanky i know these are the things you know when uh, 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 this film actress i don't remember her name uh, uh, she always carried who was having relationship with agassi and before agassi married uh, steffi graf so she always carried her socks the socks she wore in her first film as a kind of good charm something you know which is which is good for you these 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 charm so things which are supposed to be supposed to be uh, to be to be good you must have seen how people you know when they go to play they touch the floor they touch the soil huh? look at the you know these are the things which we associate so similarly my mother used to do the same thing it doesn't mean that that kind of sound will lead to the processing of milk no a kind of relationship and you as psychologists know better than i do that how these these relationships go on obviously if i keep a red hanky it is not going to make me play better but i find more comfort if this is this around around me huh? and these are the things which come to be associated with that many people i had a supervisor for my mphil who always wore brown color trousers and a brown shirt always and we were all intrigued why this gentleman he was a phd from harvard university one of the distinguished scholars of delhi university always so one day i had the courage i mustered courage to ask him sir his name is is alive professor k b gupta uh, from sociology so i asked him sir why is it that you always wear light brown color shirt and uh, brown trousers and a brown pair of socks and brown shoes you are very brownie so he said well uh, i think i think that i feel more comfortable in it hmm? now these things develop some <coughs> some people follow the the same style so that kind of a practice today how many families process curd at home huh? they go to the market and buy probiotic or this or that you know how the products are being made available and remember do not forget one thing which is called called the power of the products the hegemony of the product okay the kind of myths which are built around them how do you know that this probiotic will cause you a stable stomach than the other curds you don't know but then you think that way you understand you think that way that it does coming to the third aspect about uh, americanization you see this has been one of the important question that after all from where all these things are coming who are the harbingers of these who are the ones who are creating and the things which are being disseminated from where are they coming hmm? are we japanese in our thinking huh? japanese have great love for their families japanese live very frugally if you ever have seen the japanese men and women they wear the same kind of dresses white uh, shirt and uh, and uh, black uh, trousers 
a pair of black trousers and a black uh, coat and they are very frugal in their eating behavior very frugal in their living styles are we like that no not at all are we following the model which is used in france or italy or hungary no everything is coming from the united states of america so actually what happens is someone called it pizza effect pizza p i w z a pizza effect here was a man called swami aghayananda bharti pizza effect now what is pizza effect pizza effect is like this that what was pizza many of you would know pizza was a low class italian dish low class made at home it was thick leavened bread the hindi for this is roti leavened bread thick leavened bread and whatever was left vegetable pieces of meat they were put on this and it was heated and the italians used to eat this it developed into pizza the same thing from low class italian families comes to texas where some italians migrate one american entrepreneur notices it it is developed into a very soft bread now on this you can make pizza with everything huh? you can put cabbage you can put meat you can put lot of cheese anything you can put and just uh, just to warm it heat it and then then it becomes becomes very very good it should be eaten hot so there must be a system by which the pizza comes from 25 kilometers to your house but it is hot enough so the moment he comes and gives you pizza you have pavlov's experiment saliva in your mouth hmm? and you eat and they say if it is not hot enough return it you find it hot enough huh? it's coming from such a such a distance pizza became an upper class thing an upper class dish the same thing has happened with the yoga yoga you have you know if you ever go to america and england you find big yoga center charging you huge amount of money for teaching you pranayam eh but this is a part of your culture okay that kind of a thing this is called pizza effect in anthropological language we say lower tradition become the great tradition hmm? something which is used locally becomes the becomes the great tradition products are marketed marketing of the of the product this entire aura which is built around the products it comes to comes to you and you are convinced about it convinced about it that this is the best thing now we come to the last verse technological what's the time now 11 ho gaya acha just 5 minutes more ne lene ko to hum 10 hours le sakte hain ha lekin i'll just 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 try to wind up because if you i think there are other speakers also who will come so now comes to the technological which you know i need not tell you much about it new technologies which are being being added the important thing is what is called obsoleteness of technologies the very important word obsoleteness when mobile phone came this little mobile i bought it in 2000 the number which i have the mobile number i have i purchased it in 2000 uh, 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 may 19th may 2000 i got this number and i bought the motorola mobile which was of 38000 rupees i bought it because my father who doesn't live with me he had his heart surgery that year incoming call was being charged 16 rupees you know very very expensive and it was such a brick like of a thing that if you keep it here for a longer time you will develop cervical spondylitis where it will go like this it's a huge and brick oh, very heavy now look at these smartphones now 
in fact many people would say one which is sitting there that there's no need for me to have a music system there's no need for me to have a, a laptop i can do everything on 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 this obsoleteness of the technology and i am sure tomorrow it is also going to become obsolete something else will come something this kind of a uh, ever changing and you have to adopt to adopt to that now it has many social consequences and i would not go into many just draw your attention to what happens in psychology now uh and i will focus upon upon just one thing which is called mental illness hmm? just one thing how psychological understanding psychiatric understanding is affected by that what do the psychiatrists follow the psychiatrists follow what is called diagnostic and statistical classification of the mental disorders this is what they follow and uh, they have been defined by uh, the intellectual globalization it's very nice word intellectual globalization all coming from from there now suppose you come across a man who indulges in solo leak solo leak is talking to oneself eh? like you are talking to us and this happens you know you will immediately say you are problematic huh you will immediately identify this person as requiring treatment requiring treatment you would say this is not a normal thing but it is quite likely that talking to oneself may be a culturally expected behavior a culturally expected behavior isn't it but you are labeling it as as, as that now touching your nose every time hmm i read in psychology in fact you know just to share with you there's one book in psychology which i have read from page to page line to line it's called morgan and king because once i decided to take the civil services examination and that was the only book i read two books child psychology by thompson and and this book a thoro i am really thoro with the with morgan and king of course that psychology must have totally totally changed now you find that certain behavioral patterns hmm, are supposed to lead to mental ailment for example living alone it would say it would lead to depression but in our culture it was supposed to be looking inwardly it was said try to spend some time with yourself what is after all meditation look into yourself okay it is not something which is uh, which is uh, an aspect of abnormalities that is why you know there is a man called waters w a w t e r s waters he wrote a book on on american psyche which was done i think if i am not mistaken 2010 or so waters uh, uh, aston waters now he says what this intellectual globalization has done particularly in the realm of psychology it has bulldozed the local forms of knowledge local ways of understanding local authority system and has created a new psychopathology a new psycho pathology say for example example if suppose i spend a lot of time in the temple huh and i start crying before the gods and the goddesses tears flowing from my eyes hmm? okay or someone goes into trance 
what is called inspirational divination. You must have seen, I have seen, I have done a lot of work on this, say in, uh, in uh, Himachal Pradesh, there are local healers, and these local healers would go into trance. And then in trance, they will diagnose your problems and suggest you the things. Okay? What will you say? You'll say they are suffering from schizophrenia. You'll say that they are having mental problems. What kind of a thing is there? This, uh, this kind of a, of a getting into, into, into trance. But you have to just move to the other side from their point of view. Their point of view. Gananath Obisikir, he's a Sri Lankan sociologist who actually works on the psychological aspect. As a footnote, I'll tell you, there's a branch in anthropology which is called psychological anthropology and people contribute, uh, contribute to this, that why one individual is different from the other individual. So he says that one of the major problems with Western psychiatry is it, it talks in terms of the management of the problem. If the person is violent, hmm, give him medicine so that the person becomes docile, sleeps. Okay? If the person depressed, give him euphoric drugs so he starts, uh, he starts feeling very happy. It does not promise total cure. Come to the local psychiatric systems, which may be called ethno-psychiatric systems. These ethno-psychiatric systems, ethno means people, they have, they have their own ways of treatment and they promise Total cure. They promise empathy. That you start loving the person. And you, you deal with it. Once I gave a lecture in the Department of Psychology where I spoke about these illnesses in Rajasthan where I did my field work. Hmm? A person who is a little slow, feeble-headed. Hmm? People call him Bhola. Bhola means simple time. Huh? If suppose someone is uh, not able to speak properly, is not able to do the work, it's not that you throw him out or you send him to a sanatorium, but rather call him Bhola and keep him. So if I have seven children, five children, four children, one of them may be Bhola, so what is the problem? Let him be like that. But that Bhola is given a lot of respect because... Lord Shiva is also Bhola Bhandari. Now that's the kind. So the person who has a mental problem, behavioral disorder, is not stigmatized. That's the point. And so, so, Water says that what American psychiatry does, it stigmatizes. And that stigma continues. What is stigma? A stigma is defined as dishonored label, under quote, which is put on the person. Okay? And it will, it has a longer uh, uh, history. Just to give you an example, suppose I go for the, appear for the post of a lecturer in Ramanujan College. I did my master's in, uh, let us say, 2015. Okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, well, I go for a job in 2019 or so. And suppose the principal asks me, well, you did your, uh, your master's in, uh, uh, in 15. What have you been doing for the last four years? And you say, sir, I suffered from mental problem. I was in the sanatorium for two years and then I'm all right, now come back. Do you think the principal will appoint me? Although I'm fine, I'm all right. Most of the people who suffer from leprosy, you can see near Okhla, huh, with the stumped fingers, they are 
let me use this word bacteriologically free but have you seen the behavior of the people towards them they don't even look at them while dropping tossing the coins in their uh, in their begging uh, bowls okay why is stigma is continuing this stigma is a product of this kind of a of a psychiatry that is why in the post tsunami case okay when these american psychiatrists went to sri lanka hmm, well it was very good intention but what they were looking for was post traumatic stress syndromes and if they did not find anything they said you would be having you understand people say bhai mujhe to koi sabda nahi aata nahi aata hoga you get my point no 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 you would be suffering sab mai jo neend theek aati hai nahi aati hai aapko neend you know that kind of imposing imposing on this how people cope up with this i was telling before i came to this hall i supervised a doctoral thesis is someone who's a well known name in psychology dr kumar ravi priya hmm? he did a phd under me and i told him that look at he worked on the post earthquake huh? uh, people in uh, in bhuj an excellent work he did he's a he's, i think you must always call him i think i i have great regards for him for his scholarship and he's a very senior man now he's a professor and i told him that look at the coping strategies of the people how people are coming to terms then there are psychologists and psychiatrists from the, the western frame of mind they would be going and saying you take this tablet or you take that tablet or go for this therapy or that therapy but how people are explaining i said proceed using the method of case study and he came up with fascinating findings i still remember the vibe which took place in 2005 or 6 early 2006 in the department of psychology being attended by all the prominent people at the time they were really you know filled with admiration for his work you know he said that people drew upon their traditional concepts it may be karma it may be sanskar it may be dharma okay that is why this jail was affected all the inmates of the jail this happened in bhuj they ran away and after everything was restored they all came to the office of the superintendent police please give us our jail they could have vanished they came and said give us our jail how people are trying to understand their own cultural patterns this is just one example hmm? how the models of human behavior which come from global intellectualism how they have harmed there is a study on the samoas you know a tribal community in uh, in 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 papua new guinea and the samoans they became so individualistic that they lost respect for their elders <coughs> they lost respect for their tradition <coughs> the entire study fell the, the entire study showed how there was disruption in the society you have several example of this type where that kind of a thinking has affected that was the reason why this manual of mental disorders when it was revised it spoke of cultural specificities it spoke of what is called culture bound syndromes or culture linked syndrome which in fact are specific to those particular cultures and they should not be treated as if they are they are cases of abnormality they may be absolutely normal in their own context for example if you ever go to kumbh mela i went once 
you'll find a sannyasi is standing on his one leg. You say, what kind of man he is? Why is he standing like this? Huh? Well, this is his value. He is perfectly normal. Huh? Or someone is smeared with the ash all over, huh? is holding the rosary like this. And for hours together, like this, you do it, your hand will be atrophied. It will become wooden. But he is doing it. This is his way of, of, of living. Thus, recognize the cultural models. And that is why the people who work on global psychology, they say, let us establish uh, my final point. I'll be closing with this. A dialogic approach. Globalization would be meaningful if the globality has a dialogue with the locality, with the local, local situation. What you are, you can't be what they expect you to be. You have to be very, very different. When I was studying in England, I still remember on the day of Vasant Panchmi, all the Indian students used to wear a yellow kurta and a white pyjama. Women would wear yellow sari. And the British used to wonder why they are, because this is Vasant Panchmi. We subscribe to, subscribe to that. For example, vegetarianism. Many of us, like for example, I am totally and exclusively vegetarian. We may have problems in different parts, but why? Do you think I'll become non-vegetarian? I had uh, low vitamin um, uh, B12. Uh, uh, I get tested, and you know, I went to the Bengali doctor, and he said, oh, this is very low, you must do something. I said, yes, because I was having some symptom, and I have to do a lot of work in Calcutta. He said, I tell you, you will be all right in 15 days. Start eating liver. I looked at him with disbelief. Liver. He said, liver will give you a lot of B12. I said, any other alternative? Eat chicken. Any other alternative? Eat egg. Any other alternative? He said, some meat. Fish. Any other thing? He didn't have anything to say. Anything to say. Then I told him, Sir, I am vegetarian. Then he said, then the only option for you is to take eight injections over a period of four months, two injections every month, which of course I'm, 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 I'm taking. Now, do you think I'll be able to change my style of living now? That's the point. This is what the dialogic approach talks about. And dialogic approach has three things to submit. Number one, the first thing, and with this I'll close. First thing is respect for each and every culture. Respect for each and every way of behavior. Respect for the individual. Number two, the sense of empathy. Feeling one with them. Not sympathy, empathy. Empathy is feeling with people. Sympathy is feeling for people. Feeling with, with people. That if I were so, I would have been like this. This kind of a, of a thing. Because respect will emerge out of this. And the third thing is critically examining. Critically examining the kind of packages which come to you under the name of American globalization. Thank you very much. Okay, respect every human being. Even if, look here, look here, even if the person may be diseased, may be having problems, yeah? Learn from the example of Mother Teresa. The joy of giving. That's a human value. Love. 
animals, love plants, love the things around you. If there's anything which can sail you through is love for everything, commitment for everything, feeling one, uh, one uh, with them. And there cannot be a discipline better than psychology to teach you human love, human, human affection. And looking with a critical mind, looking with a critical, critical idea, looking with this, with this critical approach. Thank you very much. <laughs>